Hello, everybody. A warm uh, welcome from uh, Heartland, Germany, or Heartland, Germany is actually Bavaria. This is the real part of Germany. Some of you have been here in, 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 on holidays, know where, where, that, where that is. Well, um, this is a quite uh, unusual way to communicate um, uh, with guys out there like you. Uh, first of all, I can't see you, but uh, for that, I have in, uh, uh, instead uh, two good old customer friends. Um, one is uh, Tom Hawthorne uh, and the other one is James Peck. Both of them uh, you should be able to see and they, they are in the picture too. Uh, old, old customers uh, and friends and uh, we had long, long discussions over the years about anything, how to make the world a better world and how to make farming a better way of farming. And um, we'll try to, uh, together with you, um, you're, you're, you're more than welcome to ask, uh, send us in for questions, but other than that, the three of us will have a discussion <clears throat> about various things concerning farming and uh, things that happens in the, in the world right now. But mainly, we want to talk about Brexit. Um, I mean, <laughs> you're out and we're still in. <laughs> and now we want to get the feeling of you guys. What do you think about it? Uh, being uh, being independent. I mean, before you start talking and, give, uh, and making and, 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 and giving your feelings about Brexit, I want to tell you. I mean, uh, a little bit like myself. I'm not a real German, but I'm a real European, um, and it's a little bit sad to not have the Tommies along anymore uh, for that. So uh, that's at least our feeling on that. You know, and I think I'm not the only one that feels like this. So how about you guys? It's like there's a real within the agricultural world. There's a there's a real mix. Uh, like, I mean, as we saw for that, we were all a bit shocked. I think that we actually decided we were going to or wanted to leave in the first place. Well, I certainly was. Uh, and still now, there's still a big mix of people who um, wanted to leave, people who uh, didn't want to leave. There's a lot of people like like myself who voted to to stay in the first place, but then when we decided to leave, we needed to get on with it and and leave. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm pleased that we've eventually got there. Uh, I'm pleased that we've got a deal of some description. Quite what that deal is, we don't know yet, because obviously it's so fresh and so new. Um, but yeah, it's, it's certainly better than a hard Brexit from from my point of view. Um, but yeah, time will tell. I think there's a lot to come out in the wash in the next um, in the next few months and probably even years, to be honest. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think there's a real sort of mix about people who. Who wanted to, to leave and people who wanted to stay and, and i think of course you've got um you know i think most people would agree that a hard brexit was probably going to be pretty damaging whereas having now avoided that for what cost we don't quite know um time will tell so james what do you think brexit will bring to you well i'm hoping there's going to be some opportunities i mean we had a complete split in the family we had my uh, my father who who was keen to to get out of Europe, and there was myself who wanted. Well, I was a Remainer, so um, we we've had a we've had a split. But like any change, I mean, we're just effectively talking about long term change here. We're looking looking for the opportunities. I mean, we found that so far, just in this last um, twelve months with with Brexit pending, that the grain stores and the grain store side of the business is, uh, has grown and it's created opportunities. We've, we've, we're fully um, uh, full, actually. All the stores are full. We've got 88,000 tonnes of grain on site at the moment. And what that's done is created a lot of cleaning work where we're starting to um, look at new internal markets. So in that sense, it's positive. Um, but, to, you know, on, on the long, long term side, I mean, if, if we look around our farms, majority of everything we have is European. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. But I mean, one, one question, question is, is, at least from our side in Europe here, uh, being a farmer myself as well, um, uh, is um, how about area payments, subsidies? Um, are they going to go away now? And uh, you're going to try to make a living uh, without uh, area payments? So, so we, have, we have a general rough idea, Michael. It's quite sort of, again, it's only been announced in the last few sort of weeks, months at the most. But um, so historically, we'd be like you, where we've had sort of 230, 240 pounds a hectare um, uh, paid every year, normally in December. Um, and that's changing now. So that, that's, that's starting from sort of this year onwards. By 2027, that's disappearing completely. But sort of starting at that midpoint, about 2023, 2024, we're having something called ELMS, which is basically what's called an environmental land management. 
And because obviously this money which has come out of um, out of the public purse, um, the big public terms everyone's talking about at the moment, public money for public good. So we're spending the public's money, therefore, what are they getting out of it? Rather than just being paid your £240 a hectare for being a, a landowner, which I've always found being a little bit not quite the right direction, it's a reward of the landowner rather than the farmer. Um, we're now getting this sort of 200 and, well, you know, we're going to get a, something to try and help replace some of this 230, 40 pounds a hectare through elms, which is things like a lot of environmentally based, um, uh, a lot sort of trying to reduce pollution, trying to reduce, uh, improve soil quality and trying to produce air quality. Again, we don't really know what it is, but it's never going to be that 230, 40 pounds a hectare. It's going to be your... 100, 120 pounds a hectare, so halfway. So, so, so what are you going to do? You're going to talk to your landlords and tell them that uh, the rents have to go down? Who knows? I mean, that's the biggest thing I struggle with at the moment is, that, you know, as you know, we're big contract farmers, so we farm a lot of land which we don't own ourselves. James will be similar. Um, uh, we don't really rent much, but we do like a share farm, contract farming arrangements with them all. And what they're going to look like in the next five, six years, I really don't know. It's, it's a tricky one. Is my is my landlord or the, the farmer who I farm with? Is he going to just take it all on the chin? I doubt it very much. Um, so you so you start thinking, well, where are we going to find this other hundred pounds a hectare, hundred and twenty pounds a hectare? And you know, fixed costs is is a big one. I think we we're carrying quite heavy amounts of fixed costs in certain places, and I think that's not just particularly me, but as an industry as a whole. Um, uh, changing farming practice, it's going to probably try and bring innovation up a little bit more. I think when you're being subsidised, innovation is always sort of stifled so um it will bring opportunity from from uh, from that point well, i'm sure we'll see a jump in that point but it's a tricky one there's a lot of talk about moving to direct drilling no tail in that sort of principle but again from my point of view absolutely that's the direction i'm going to go or pointing the ship towards but for me to stop doing one or two cultivation passes that might save me 30 40 pounds a hectare doesn't get me 100 and something pounds a hectare so where's yeah, the, yeah. The, the next benefit beyond that from from a no-till point of view and it's got to be reducing the, you know we've got to reduce our inputs we've got to be you know reducing our capital involved in the farm so by doing that we've got less capital involved in the farm from a machinery point of view um so yeah it's it's i don't think people know quite what they're going to do and i don't think until we sort of get the real meat out of what elms is going to be and with the government direction they want agriculture in the uk to sort of go we don't quite know where that's going to be but a lot of change i would have said in the next five six seven years i would have thought a lot of change interesting, interesting. quite a big change here it, it, just prior Christmas, when this announcement came in of the 60% of the BPS reduction by 2024, which effectively to me would be equivalent to £600,000, we, we're going to have to make some substantial changes here. And, and, and in doing that, we're actually being probably slightly radical in the sense that we're looking to reduce liability and, um, and, and costs. And, and one way for us to do that quite quickly is actually to stop growing sugar beet and potatoes, which represents about 21% of our rotation. But just by uh, removing those will make a, a, a difference to us, could double our overall net profit. And the, the main motivation that we had for growing those crops were before is that, you know, they were £40 a tonne for sugar beet, which is now 20 And, of course, it was all driven by black grass and in, increasing our rotations and, and, and cropping, which we've now done. And we've put a, a, a big dent in, into black grass. But as soon as you're not going to receive those checks, I mean, we used to be a, a contract farm based business on a sort of an 80 20. In the last three years, we've gone for we've changed that dramatically to a rent model from a contract farm model. And we're now more of a 80% um, rent, 20% contract farm. Now, that means that that um, reduction is going to affect us uh, dramatically. And I think that the expecting landlords to change overnight is going to be a tough pill to, for them to. Uh, absorb because people's lifestyles have been created on the back of rent checks so we've got to first of all look to try and reduce our overall cost and um the quickest way effectively of doing that is to become more efficient uh, and that's why we're making this big change now to, to go back to a fully combinable crop model mm -hmm. i'm sure there will be quite a few of uh, pockets of land probably big areas of land which will in the next few years won't be growing a, a combinable crop, an arable crop, it'll be put into an environmental scheme, those you know, low-lying wet areas. The, the areas of 
<laughs> big blocks of land which you're not making money from by farming without a, without any sort of sort of support to it. So I can imagine that will happen. So, but it's how we all adjust our fixed costs based around that as well. So we're gonna, you know, we're all used to farming this set area. So therefore, if we suddenly take a 10% um, area reduction or 20% area reduction because you're being funded on those areas to do something else with something environmental. Um, then, then obviously fixed costs have got to change with that. I think fixed costs have got to change dramatically. Full stop. I think, you know, we, I mean, it's, we, it's so. The, the environmental aspect that people are sort of all dreaming of, I've actually got a slightly polar opposite view on. We currently have 20% of our acreage which is down into environmental schemes, and going forward, I'm actually looking to come out of those and focus wholly on. Um, on the combinable cropping side. Now you might say, well, you've got wet areas and things, but actually the majority of the land in the, in the eastern counties is in pretty good order and is good growing crop land. And there isn't actually this vast acreage of really poor land. There's more poor size fields, that, which reduces your efficiency than there is actually historically the, the, these inefficient areas. Now, the main reason of focus of that is actually the environmental aspect has been more of a social call for us to do that more than a financial. And, and the reality is for us as a business, the environmental um, areas are putting them, it doesn't pay. When you've got to pay a big check, uh, for, for rent and things, and then you've been doing environmental. When we were at sixty pound a ton, when we first all went into these environmental schemes, it did work. Now you start looking at the price of wheat at two hundred pound a ton. These environmental areas, they'd be better cropped. Yeah, but, uh, but um, <coughs> let's let's go on with, with this a little bit now with these environmental issues. I mean, uh, comparing notes uh, now that you're that you're by yourself and you're Brexit, and we're still on uh, still within the European. Uh, the union and, um, um, and I'm sure you're aware of this green deal uh, that was basically uh, approved uh, uh, by the end of last year uh, and now we are full into it and um, what I mean if you go through this green deal uh, we're, we're facing right now um, I mean basically what is it I mean uh, we have to reduce 50% of all our, our pesticides in farming within the next uh, 30 years and 10% of that 50% uh, of that have been achieved in less than 10 years so the pressure is there big pressure then we're forced to reduce our fertilizer use by at least 20% um, uh, antibiotics in, 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 in animal farming have to be reduced by by 50% and the European Union wants to see by 2030 at least 25% of the farm being uh, land being farmed organically okay the organic farming part is not that what concerns me because that's basically a market driven thing and 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 and, uh, and a thing that where it fits it makes sense and where it doesn't fit it doesn't make sense um, but what would you uh, I mean and, and listening to what, what your environmentalists are, are thinking now right now loud uh, and what the pressure they've been putting on you already before brexit and uh, what, what, what now they do uh, even that's probably the downturn of brexit uh, that you have Brexit, now, now that the forces, the local environmental forces become stronger in England, is, is that right? Uh, I, I would imagine so. I think, I think rather than Brussels dictating to us now, it'll be London dictating to so, us. So that means uh, it, uh, implicates it implicates that, uh, that maybe you're going even a little bit further than what the Green Deal uh, is trying to, 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 to enforce. And um, so, so what, what, would, what is your what, what, what is your uh, answer to cutting uh, fifty percent of all your uh, all, all your chemical uh, uh, not not the chemical bill that's nice on the on the on the on the, on the bottom line, but uh, actually cutting your chemical use. <clears throat> I think I've I've seen this coming. I think for a few years, to be honest, and I think it's a sort of a, also a slightly a natural progression on what what's been happening so that so historically oh, when we've been growing um you know we've been growing uh, these arable crops there's always been an answer which has come okay. out of the can and and, and the, the principle of having the answer out of the can is brilliant but the problem was it always you abuse that principle because you always knew there was going to be the next chemical or the next sort of input pesticide to be able to try and cure what you're doing and we sort of it took us away from the decent farming practices Absolutely, I'm a big purveyor of using pesticide. I want to carry on using pesticide, and it's, it has a, a hugely important role in what we're doing. But we have to be a lot more controlled in what we're doing with it. So we've already talked already before, obviously, that we started doing this about crop rotation. We've all gone to these bigger rotations now. That's going to lead to actually using less pesticide quite considerably. Um, and then I just think you've got to be realistic with it. What doesn't help is, and I don't know whether it's the same in Germany, but in the UK we have... Um, distribution to so the people who are selling us our pesticide they're very good at sort of 
pushing you to use the next one or to use more of it. Uh, it's a marketing thing. It's a big thing. And actually, do we need to use it? Absolutely, we need to use some, uh, but do we really need to use it? And, and again, nitrogen's a, a, another one. Again, if you if you want to talking about carbon and reducing your carbon footprint, we've got to reduce the amount of bag nitrogen or mineral nitrogen we're using. And that's something already at Flora we're practicing, practicing this year. We're going to run some fields where we're reducing considerably our total nitrogen usage. You know, we've we've been spending twelve years building our soils up now with manures. We should be benefiting from it. Um, so I think it, I think our next stage is to start dropping that down to trying to, you know, we used to grow really good crops of wheat on 160 kilos of nitrogen. And we're now trying to use 240s and 50s, you know. For, and again, it's a bad habit is that we're trying to always assume we're going to grow 14 and 15 tonnes a hectare of wheat when in fact the farm average is more like nine and a half to ten. So let's grow the nine and a half to ten. Let's try and use technology a bit more, I think, as it comes to see that actually in that situation you are, you can grow 14 or 15 tons a hectare because we know that huge swing in yield is all down to the weather. You know, it's not yes. really down so, to what we're doing. So you've got to be a bit more mindful of what you spend. Let, 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 let's let, let me let me guide this this discussion in a little bit uh, different direction. And for that, I want to show you a little video clip I took about six weeks ago when I was in Brazil. Just watch it. One one left then. Left John. What you see there is a customer of mine, just like you, only has a, he farms a little more, 70,000 hectares. Father and son operation, hands on, hands on. Uh, and you see their airport and there, you see their air tractors there, he's got three of them spraying about 10,000 hectares a day. And now you see the, 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 the uh, hangar right next to the airport. And what do you see in that hangar? You see fermenters, a whole bunch of fermenters, I think 25 of them. And every other one is a, a different bacteria. What he does there is he basically, he produces his own bacteria mixes uh, and puts it, it, it's all live bacteria, so he, as he produces, as they're finished, he puts them in, in, in those containers, out it goes to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the airplanes and he sprays it on. Uh, a year and a half ago when I was last there, uh, uh, he wouldn't even talk about biological insecticides. It, it's only about insecticides. He's not yet, yet into fungicides. He wouldn't even talk about it. He'd say, oh, my neighbors are doing it. It's not, still, it, uh, well, I'm not really that much interested in it. Now he put up a new hangar and he's full into it. And I said, Cornelius is his name. I said, Cornelius, uh, are you just playing around with it or are you taking it serious? Well, look at that hangar. I built that hangar for even another 50 of those fermenters. I put already 25 of them in there. And um, uh, so far, and his son is even more into it, so he said, we saved about five or six million dollars in insecticides on 70,000 hectares just by going biological. Does it work? Well, about 80%. So we're still using some chemicals on the site in some insecticides. But the next step is that we're going to put bacteria on for fixing nitrogen because they think they can do, reduce the nitrogen bill in corn and maize dramatically if they do that. And then the next thing is that they also want to go, like as I see with other farms, that they go and, do, and use the same principles with, with, with fungus on fungicides. You know? uh, not saying that they replace chemicals 100%. It's only, uh, it's only they, they know when it works and they know what to put on, then they do it biological. And if it doesn't work, they put a chemical on. But when you ask them why they do it, they always smile and say, look at the savings. And then the guy, one guy said to me six weeks ago, he was big into, into biological spraying on you know, his 50,000 hectare lot. He said, you know what? We can produce soybeans cheaper yet. Bah. What have we to say there? I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to challenge you too much, guys. Don't, don't expect that, uh, that this will work exactly the same way in our climate. Because it also it has to do with the rotation of the climate they have there that allows them in Brazil uh, to actually think like that and use this kind of technologies as bio, microbiologists. It's actually, it's, actually they, they're replacing their agronomist with a microbiologist. And they have their own labs. The big farms have their own labs uh, on the farm. And they... Then they, 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 they go scout their fields every day and, uh, and scout the weather and, 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 and make, make sure that the, the, the air, air humidity is right and the fungus is right, the bacteria is right. It's a lot of work. That's what they tell you. It's a lot, 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 lot more work. But they save a lot of money. And... Interesting thing for me, Michael, on it is the fact that 
I like I, I, it, there's been a lot of talk about it, and there's been a sort of it's been discussed a lot in the UK as well at the moment. But what we have to be in the problem we have in the UK is when the new idea, which is led by farmers or led by the geeks of the industry, it always happens quite quickly, and it's always something which sort of does show some effects quite quickly. What happens we, we seem to get in the UK is it gets jumped on by the big companies who then turn it into this big marketing thing, and it becomes something which actually it's hard to find something or prove something actually is better or isn't better because it, it's all played around in the industry with marketing and smoke and mirrors really to, to well, understand this it. is interesting what say, you say but what i learned in brazil and i'm seeing this for five years for the last five years because i go there quite frequently we have quite a, we have quite a good business there and we have lots of lots of customers just like you there very hands-on uh, big operators um it's actually the opposite it's actually the losers right now is the likes of monsanto and syngenta uh, look where the stocks of Monsanto are right now, you know. Uh, and part of the reason is because of Brazil is going down for them, yeah, big time. Uh, and, um, and it's in the hands of small startups that basically concentrate on, 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 on microbiologics uh, and, uh, and learn technologies that's been known for hundreds of years, only it was too complicated to use. And now all of a sudden they say, hey, uh, farmers are ready to, 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 to make a change, and uh, one, one, change, one reason is they save money, the other reason is they have resistances, you know, with this monoculture of soybeans and whatsoever, they have lots of insect, insect resistances and fungicide resistances, and even Roundup resistances, you know, and so they're looking for other technologies, and it's not only uh, chemical technologies, it's also biological technologies, and they take it very rational, it's not something like it's, uh, it's all of a sudden they've gone and, 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 and adapted a new uh, religion, and, you know, they, they it's, it's, it's just very, very rational. You know, they say, hey, this works, and, uh, and we understand how it works. And the funny part, and this is another thing, uh, in principle, what um, I start to learn from the Brazilians, uh, which we also can adapt from them in terms of the, 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 the thought rationale, not saying that one-to-one -one it will work. Like, like we discussed before we started this meeting, you know, Tom uh, and James, um, for them, uh, it's not the biological uh, uh, insecticides and fungicides that's so important uh, to use. It first starts in the soil. They want to get the biome, the, the, the biological balance in the soil right. And the only way to do it is, is not with the main crop. The main crop they call a monoculture. The main, a monoculture of soybeans, a monoculture of maize is, is not very good for the soil health. Um, so what they do is they reduce the, the, the number of growing days of uh, the monoculture crop they grow and increase the number of days for the cover crop, which they now call the main crop. So the cover crop at the end of the day is a secret. And instead of having a 100 days cover crop, they now increase to a 200 day cover crop. 80 day soybeans, 100 day maize, and in between 200 days of cover crop. And that cover crop, they put a lot of attention to. The way they plant it, the way they seed it, the way they put it, it's all about diversity, big diversity in different types of crops, matching with certain soils and certain climate zones and so on. And uh, even, so that even though when they, even they fertilize sometimes the cover crops and so on, you know, to make sure that they get really the, the, what the soil needs and the soil biological, the biology needs and the diversity of the soil biology needs in those 200 days. So they can afford to have another 100 days of stress for the soil and for the crop, then bring in another cover crop. And so it's quite interesting, this thinking, you know. In a way, when you, look, when you watch us and when you watch you guys and, and, and our, some of our best neighbors, we are thinking the same way. We are not, only, we are not able to express it yet, you know. That we understand that a, 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 very, a very good crop of wheat, a very good crop of sugar beets, a very good crop of, uh, of barley is, uh, is a stress to the soil. Uh, but for the sake of getting a crop off, we have to do it. But let's, let's make sure that that stress is, is, is a, that the, soil, the soil can stand it, the biological life can stand it, and then give it a relief, you know? And the relief is, is also a spring crop and a, and a winter crop. The relief is a cover crop in between or a crop interseeded before you take the main crop off and blah, 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 blah. And um, so it's quite interesting. And then they say the biologicals, the biological insecticides and fungicides work a lot better when they get the soil biology, you know, the, the soil life in balance. And so it's a counter reaction. And, and they have a very rational way to go about this. 
You know, uh, when you talk to organic farmers and guys from the regenerative farming side, a lot of it is like this, you know, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, this, uh, uh, it's, it's just nice to do and it's just so nice uh, to, to go about environment and we don't understand everything. Plants talk to each other and root systems talk to each other and, and the mycorrhiza here and there and blah, blah, blah. Uh, yes, it's all, it's all right, but there's too much, uh, there's too much, uh, uh, it's, 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 it becomes a little bit irrational for, for, for some of us, you know, to, to listen to this. Even knowing, knowing that there's something to it, there's something to it. We don't know what it is, but it's, if you go to Brazil, them guys, they don't, they don't, they don't, it's not like, it's not like a religion anymore. It's, it's like, oh, this is facts. We understand it now. We know why this is, why this works. And when it works, we know how to use it. And if you farm 70,000 hectares and try to play a little bit with chemicals or biologicals, it doesn't work on 70,000 hectares. You know what it means if something goes wrong, you know? So you wouldn't do it unless you're hundred percent safe that uh, you first understand what you're doing and it's proven what you're doing before you do it, you know? And that's, that's, what's so, that's what, what makes me, so, what, what's always so exciting for me to, 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 go, to follow those guys, to go along with those guys year after year when you see them, when you go there, how they learn step by step with those startup companies, uh, these uh, new, new type of uh, agronomists and bio, uh, microbiologists, uh, learning from each other, exchanging, uh, exchanging ideas and, 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 the, uh, and experiences from farm to farm and learning very fast, you know. <clears throat> And um, here's something going on. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's not 100% adaptable to where we're in your climate or our climate, but the rationale to go about this is exciting for me. And, and I think in the UK there is a movement towards that. There is definitely a, a big movement towards that, which is you could call it regenerative, you could call it decent farming practice. It's definitely improving. Everyone, the big buzzword is improving your soil improving you know you know farming with nature not farming against it and um you know the, the days of the chemical revolution are, are still going to be there but i'm sure they're they're less important than they perhaps were there is an element though but this is pandering to to people extremists in a, who are out there against agriculture you know the rea the reality is i don't i don't believe that 10 years ago tom that we were um, abusing soil and and necessarily trying to to degrade it or, or, or anything like that. Maybe the rotations were shorter than they, they were. And if you look at the true reason of why we've perhaps lengthened our rotations, it's been more the lack of chemical control than it has actually been because we woke up and had a, a vision that we needed to to do that. You know, the, the, this, we, we seemed as an industry, it always amazes me, but we get into this rhythm of the attack that we're, we're under, but we suddenly start taking buzzwords and saying oh yes we're going to do this and we're going to embrace cover crops it's going to make all the difference you start taking away payments and reducing them by 60 percent and still having to maintain some level of rent checks and things i think it's going to be quite a slow upkeep uh, or, or uptake sorry or, or, on on this big change in this revolution that we're talking about in, in in going green because i don't think people are going to be able to afford to do it but i think that's probably where your support's going to come from james you're going to get supported to do that i think so you know and that could be something as simple as supplying you with cover crop seed or it could be something as simple as paying you more for growing a cover crop if that makes sense i think that's Wait, where it's going to come from that's I, the direction. Well, james james, james where, 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 I'm, 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 where you're totally right is um, um is let's not get over excited about this because especially uh, when it when 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 well obviously we're in a in a kind of a public talk today and when all of a sudden the public says, "Oh, hey, here's a new technology. It's all biological. Hey, let's let's enforce it. Let's 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 do all our our our, our, our law our our, our our lawmaking lawmakers to, to make laws according to this that the farmers are forced to, to, to use this technology because somebody said it's going to work. You know, um, that's the big danger behind this. Uh, that's why I say um, we. That's why I talk about this rational. The rational is it's not organic farming what I'm talking about here. Yeah. It's a, it's a very well balanced mix between using still the old technology in terms of chemicals and understanding more the complexity between soil biology, plant biology, and, bio, uh, and biological products to, 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 to actually enforce certain, uh, certain, certain effects on a plant or to resist insecticides or resist a, a fungicide attack and whatsoever. Not saying that it always works. Yeah? And it's, it's, it's a mix, it's a mix between the two. 
And, uh, uh, and let's, let's be careful. I mean, um, let's not talk down Monsanto and Syngenta and BASF. I mean, if they, if they lose interest in farm chemicals, we are pissed, guys. That's the fact. We are pissed. So let's make sure that they are still stay around and let's make sure that they make their money and they make enough money to put it in R&D and uh, do the right uh, and, and come up with the right products and the right technologies to go along with biologicals. And I think that's what the, where the change is going. Um, and let's make sure that our public is understanding this. And that's not too much idealistic thinking that all of a sudden we go from one extreme to the other extreme and we make all the, and, and, and we, we, we make subsidies for it and we force farmers to go for it. And um, it's not going to work. I think, as ever, the, the problem is in the industry, you have very good farmers and you have, and, and then you have, but you have the tail end who are, are the ones who are polluting. They are the ones who are, who've got their soil eroding. And it's getting those guys because they're the ones that people see. They're the ones which are perhaps giving it a bad reputation. They're the ones who don't care. And I think that's important. I think as the, as a, the next generation of farmer becomes younger and younger, they're more into climate change. They're more into carbon suppression. They're more into looking after their, you know, they're more into the image of agriculture. And I think that's, you know, that's important. I think that's why this sort of this is shift at the moment of trying to G up British agriculture, because at the moment it's in this doldrums. It's sort of stuck in its own way, if that makes sense, which I'm not saying is particularly wrong. But as ever, there's the people at the bottom end of there who aren't behaving themselves, who are using too much pesticide when they shouldn't be. They are over fertilizing, they're letting their soils run off into the river. You know, it's that sort of problem. It's trying to cure that problem. The top end of farming is probably perfectly good enough as it is now, the top 25%. It's that bottom 25% which needs to improve. It's interesting what you say. Um, um, I, I just had the same, uh, the same uh, 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 discussion talk with two, two, two German farmers uh, uh, two hours ago, and it was all about Green Deal as well. And the outcome between the three of us was that that Green Deal that's now signed and that's now put in place in, in, in the rest of Europe, which you're not part of it anymore, um, is actually more an opportunity for us farmers than, uh, than a downturn. So we, were, we, we, are more, we, are, we agreed that this is actually, there's more opportunities there than it pushes, put, puts, us more, uh, puts us again in, into a corner and we can't get out and make less money out of it. Um, so, that's actually how we feel now. And it's not only the three of us. I think there's more and more out there that, that, that understand that. And the other thing we came up with, where we agreed is that good farming practices are valid again. It's not farming the system anymore, which it used to be. It's actually a, a understanding the complexity between uh, plants and microbiology microbiolo bi and markets and machinery and, and rotations and so on. It's a huge complex to understand that and manage it. So that actually what a farmer is about, a good farmer is about. Be a multi-talented person that understands everything. That's the only way to make a profit at the end. And I think this is what we feel it, with the Green Deal comes back. Because it's not that stupid. You know? And as you say, the young generation uh, you're younger than me, but you still have, a, there's another generation uh, in front of you that's, that, that's coming. Uh, they are already out there and they're already talking, they're already talking those topics about climate change and, uh, and diet change and blah, 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 and all this. Hey, I want to show you uh, another, another a little video clip. Uh, you'll like that. You may hate it, but you like it. Kannst du den Harris Clip mal laufen lassen? Den Harris Clip, hast is it is a, ready? That's a very... You can't see it? Oh, you couldn't see it? Oh, shoot. Anyway, but you can hear it. We make it loud. Certain countries it's have a, changed their dietary a, guidelines a, 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 uh, to reduce the, talk show, the consumption of red meat uh, uh, in light Harris, of the impact the of, of the climate change. The new vice president uh, of the United States, she was giving a, a talk on a, on a talk show before elected. Dietary guidelines and then how just, just you plan seconds. on implementing the changes so that people effectively change their diets. 
Anyway, what yeah, Kamala I mean, is talking about... She, and thank the, you, Carol, the, for your the, work on the question. The, um, the, uh, is, the, the journalist, I, I she's asking the, her... I think the point that you're raising... Uh, do you in the, think in, we in need a, a diet context, change which is in North America, that in the United States? As a nation, States. we actually Kamala, have to and, uh, how about have a real meat? priority at the highest level of government around what we eat. Do we have to ban red meat? And Kamala what Harris we said, and in terms of we eating, have a problem in the United States. We have a health issue. People are too fat, they're eating too much junk food, and a big part of it is, is, is the overconsumption of red meat and processed food. And the only way to make people healthier is have a discussion going on what we eat in the future, how we eat, and having regulations on, processing, on food companies and processing companies and so on to make sure that our people get healthier. Is it work? Uh, I think okay. that, that was the video. Uh, so, so the audience, the audience. basically, they, they got the whole thing of it. Hopefully, I, I, I interpreted it right. So, anyway, what is Kamala Harris? She is vice president of the of the um, of the stolen election, <laughs> um, and um, there is a reason why she became the vice president because she is representing a. A, a, a big chunk of the society that wants a major change. It's not a personal issue of her because she says, she, I'm also eating cheeseburgers. Not that I'm not, uh, not a vegan or whatever. But she's representing a modern part of the society that is basically looking at health. And health has to do with what you eat. That's where it starts. And whatever we do, Whatever we, can dis whatever we discuss, that's where it starts. And let's face it, what you and I have been working on for the last 20, 30, 40 years, well, you're a little younger than me, um, is all about make, uh, feeding people so they get fat. And now the result is that there's more and more people unhealthy because they're fat than they're healthier. And who, who, who gets killed with the coronavirus? in England. The skinny ones, the ones with the health the issues. And there's, there's a direct relation between health issues and weight and what you eat. And you know, we all were talking about that the coronavirus should kill all the people in, uh, uh, in Africa. What do you hear about Africa? Tch, people that sleep on the floor, eat with their dirty hands, food from the floor, they have no, 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 no issues with their, their immune system. They have a very strong immune system. If you go to Africa, to some kinds of uh, 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 Africa, you have to get shots from your doctor and then and after two, three days you have a diarrhea. Because our immune system, okay, it's, it's not as strong as theirs, not set for theirs. So here, they, where we thought the coronavirus would kill them, it's not necessarily kill them. But it's killing our people, it's killing the old people, it's killing the fat people, it's killing the people that have not a strong immune system. And there's a direct relationship to what we eat. And now this becomes a government program in the biggest, in the biggest, in the biggest uh, country in the world, which you would never imagine that it would ever happen, at least with the other idiot before. Uh, uh, and now it becomes a program, a program. Guess what that does? I mean, I have two hearts in my, in, my, in, my, in, my, in my chest. I mean, one of my best customers in the United States are corn and, uh, corn and bean growers. They only grow two crops, corn and beans. What is it for? The beef. For the beef. So, should I, should I say, hey, let's not talk about this, let's ignore it. Let's say, oh, it's never going to happen because meat consumption is going to go up and people want to get fatter yet and, and there's you know, a lot of people that are still not fat enough, so let's make them fat, you know, and so on. And we'll have a great, li like a great life for, forever in, in exporting our grain everywhere in the world and it's going to go up and up and up and up. Or should we rather sit there, the three of us, and make this an issue? At least be concerned what's happening out there. And that's what I actually want to get at. You know, I want to just, I want to just, I, I don't want to make us, it, it, it's not nothing new what I'm talking about. And it's not me or, 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 uh, that's first time uh, mentioning this. I think we're all aware of this discussion. We're all aware of these issues. But, I mean, maybe Corona is right now teaching us another lesson to make 
this dire change that is now a political, a political program in the United States happen. And it's, if it's happening, it will have a direct influence of what we grow out there in our fields. Do you think, Michael, it's down to the fact that, that food's cheap? You know, that, 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 that sort of certainly the, the, your fattier foods, your unhealthy foods are generally your cheaper end of the spectrum foods, aren't they? So they're well, cheap foods. I mean, you in, 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 in the English in the in the English uh, 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 language, you even have a nice word for it. You call it junk food. You know, junk food. It, I mean, the, just the expression of junk food tells everything. Tells the whole story. I mean, I mean, and the more we contribute as farmers to produce junk food, we will get back junk. Well, my the price is, 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 is everything when it comes to, 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 to food consumption. I mean, this is a quite a difficult conversation for me because you and um, uh, Tom are like uh, greyhounds and I'm the biggest <laughs> I've ever been over this Christmas period in Chrono. I seem to have oh, had a good white mate. I feel like a stop beef it. animal. Stop, stop it. it. <laughs> but stop. If you, the difficulty is with, with, with uh, putting weight on is it's not always about the price of food, it's about the taste of food. And about the convenience of it. And convenient it's not, food. It's not, it's not a place. I totally agree. Yeah. Totally you, agree. you can go and spend five pounds and get a get a meal at McDonald's or wherever it is, or go into your fuel station and pick up your chocolates and things like that. And it tastes good. It makes you feel good. And 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 uh, sadly, it does put weight on. But I, I can tell with you know my children who are six and eight, but the education there happened at the school and things. They don't seem to be into the, um, the the meat and veg routine that that I sort of grew up with. They're, they're very much into not eating meat, and it's because I think that there's an element of the fact that they're that, that they're classmates and, and and people all different religions and, and nationalities, and of course with, with that they come with different eating habits, and the children pick up on that, and their best friend might not be into eating meat, so that it rubs off on them, and there is going to be a big change. That there is there is no doubt, and. You know, if our farming businesses in England are based on producing feed for, um, you, you know, beef, then, you know, there may be a downturn in the market if the population doesn't continue to grow. But I'm, I'm fairly confident that actually new markets and opportunities will open up to what we can grow. and We will just follow where the money is, one for better work. Exactly. That, that, that's what we do. I mean, agro farmers like you should not be concerned uh, as much as anybody else, because you can switch from one year to another year to whatever the market needs. But uh, where I want, where I like to le lead this uh, uh, discussion is, uh, and it's not the first time we've been talking about this, um, is um, that we actually should be aware what could become a reality soon in the world, in terms of, and it's not about vegans and vegetarians. This is only a niche market. It may still increase. It is about a change in diets in terms of a little less uh, animal-based food to a little bit more plant-based food. I think that's at the end what we'll see. And when you talk, like a good friend of mine, he is one of the largest uh, 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 chick, uh, 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 um, chicken producers uh, in Europe, um, uh, for for laying for laying hens and especially for for uh, for uh, what do you call them broilers, yeah? and he says and he sells his chickens all over the world, you know, his little birds, and he says the increase in chicken is going, I mean the 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 speed of increase is going down every year, so you can show actually you can see actually when the curve is actually flattening and going down, and he puts it, guess where he puts his investment right now. So more chicken breeding facilities, more chicken. No, into plant-based meat and to, uh, in, in, uh, into uh, artificial meat and whatsoever, all kinds of stuff. That's where he puts his money. So he 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 he's on the edge. You know, he knows, he sees it. He's the first. He's, he's the first. The first person in the world, actually, or the first per, f, f, the, one of the first person in the world that can see this change actually, reality, reality happening before we actually see it happening. So. And I think we should not get overexcited here, and we should not say, hey, there's something coming here, and we better quit farming. No, no, forget it. No, it is only, at the end of the day, a slight shift, and that's what we should be aware. And we should be aware 
where for us farmers, not only the herbal farmers, we are the luckier ones because we can switch our farming around, the rotations around as, as we want. It's more for the, for the, for the, for the animal guys. Uh, um, I think there the potential is that the quality, it's not the amount of uh, meat you produce, it's the type of meat you produce. Because it's not that people stop eating meat, it is just when they eat meat, they want a better quality. They want, they want also the animal welfare part to go with it, you know, and, and all, all the other things. And I think there is a huge potential. The thing is, though, Michael, that there is a lot of part of the UK in particular which is, is suited to arable farming and there are other parts which are suited to livestock. And you can't go and get a combine and a cultivator going up some of the hills and, and, and areas that the livestock industry is, is, is developed in. I, 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 there is no doubt that people's eating behaviours will change. It may be price driven, it, as you rightly said. It might be that suddenly you find that uh, beef it costs a lot more, and people make the decision, you know, not not to eat it as as often. But the thing is, for me, as an individual, I, you know, e eating meat is is a big part of my life, and 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 you know, my future eating habits. The children are going to be the big swing of change, and. The killing with my children actually is one of the main reasons that I think they're less interested in meat production is that they're growing up in a different environment where they don't like how livestock is becomes food. And, and I can see that as more of the problem. Uh, it's, 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 the animal part is at the end, it's, it's more, the, it could be, I mean, you could argue whether it's the diet change that's needed or it's, the, it's, it's this, this, this soft thing about animal welfare and animals have to be treated like human beings and so on. Uh, whatever it is, at the end of the day, both, both things go in the same direction and change. Pre-coronavirus, you know, all they were talking about in the papers, you know, associated with farming was the methane and whatever produced out of livestock that was, you know, eroding the um, ozone layer. Suddenly, obviously, coronavirus came in and we had lockdowns and you saw the pollution numbers drop dramatically. You know, we, we go in these peculiar waves. And, and I think one of the things I would like to see better in, in, in the industry is that we are very poor at telling our message. And we, I think we're very good at jumping on the, the bandwagon for, for travelling at the time. And we do need to be better at orchestrating what we're doing and why we're doing it and, and the reason we farm and it isn't just for pure profit and money there is longevity there is generational behavior in how we treat the land and the crops we grow and the reasons you, you know that you, you look at the way that we all behave and we, we, we the crops we grow and, and and the reasons we're doing it we're not doing it for the quick buck otherwise we would perhaps go back to continuous wheat you know there are many models that show that if you grow continuous wheat actually we would be more profitable as a business yes um, yeah, yeah I, agree. I agree i agree but but uh, going on with our subject and um and adding another another piece to it um um we, claim from, we came from uh, cutting chemicals and microbiology in the soil and so on and so on. And uh, uh, then we went into a diet change. Um, and uh, now the, the, the third piece, um, at the end, it all, always boils down to the climate change part. You know, this, this climate change thing, is all, everything is related. Diets are related with climate change. Chemical use and whatsoever is also somewhat related to climate change. But I think there's another element in climate change we should not underestimate, especially as arable farmers, that could maybe another source of income long term or short term, uh, uh, which is uh, carbon sequestering or carbon, uh, carbon credits. Um, uh, and let's talk about this for a minute. Um, what a big shift of change. If you effectively created a uh, a, a carbon trading platform that uh, industry would would pay farmers for um, you know carbon we and and that meant that we weren't doing tillage for example or plowing that's where you would see a massive change as long as that was financially you know much more viable and became an important part uh, important crop one for better word but, but James before, before we, we talk about a possible platform that's out there to trade we have to basically prove that we have, that we understand, that we use practices and understand practices and can measure how much we can store. And I think that's where we, it's, we have a chicken and egg problem here. We first have to start there. I think we first have to understand how to actually sequester carbon. Because there's too much, too much, uh, 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 how to say, uh, uh, um, 
soft, uh, soft understandings out there how to do it, but facts are hard to grab there. Uh, let me let me give you let me give you a, 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 some um, some th another uh, again another practical thought rationale. Um, when you when you look like statistics here in Bavaria uh, about farming statistics, uh, they do every five years they check the carbon content in our soils. Arable land, in average in Bavaria, has 2%. Grassland, I mean farmed grassland, I mean grassland that's been farmed, yeah? Grassland has 5%. And tell me that the arable, land, the, 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 the arable field next to a grass field, the arable field is poor soil and the grass field is good soil. It's the other way around. It's England too. So, if you have fields to field, next to fields, how is it possible that on farmed grassland we have 5% in average and on, on, on arable land we have 2% in average. So maybe we should first start to understand what's happening on the grassland, on the permanent grassland, which is farmed. That means you cut the grass and you force the grass to regrow again. You fertilize it either with, chem with chemical fertilizer or with manure and so on. And uh, you sometimes inter intercede some new crops into it and blah, 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 blah. That's what I mean, you know, that's what increases. But there's also a limit. It's not like uh, that, that there's out there grassland that's been farmed very, very well that all of a sudden ends up at 20% uh, carbon content. There's a balance. It looks like it's 8 to 10% with a max, depending on the, on the clay content, what, where it gets at and what the climate is. And then, it's, it's, then, then at the end of the day, it circles itself. But the difference between 2 to 5 to 6 is threefold. And if you put it in, in, in carbon dioxide equivalent, uh, three to five percent. This is more like 300 to 400 metric tons of carbon dioxide stored more in grassland over arable land. And now put a price on it. Actually, the, the CEO of, of VW, Dies, he put last year in Davos, he had a, uh, there was an interview of, uh, from, from, from Times Magazine or whatever, and he put a price himself on a ton of carbon dioxide. What he thinks at the end of the day it will be worth. It's $100 a ton. So going from 2 to 5%, saying there's 300 to 400 metric tons of carbon dioxide stored on top of the arable land in grassland, this is an equivalent of thirty to $40,000 a hectare. I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating here. Maybe it's a little bit uh, over the top. But just if you start to imagine this, numbers, and knowing that uh, with this regenerative type of farming attitude and, and some other things, it's possible, uh, some, there's some proof out there already, that 0.1% increase is there, which is about equivalent of 10, 10 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, equivalent a year in arable farming, which by, by $100 is $1,000 an, an a hectare. And I know you guys, if you, even at a $500 an hectare, uh, you would run every mile you can run, you know? Uh, to get that. So there's potential there. There's big potential there. The big problem, because I'm, I, because through my business and as a farmer, I'm, I'm, as you know that, uh, we're deeply interested in understanding more about this and not only dream about it. Um, uh, the more we talk to the few people that understands what's going on here in the soil, there's very, very few scientists in the world that actually can give you, uh, can give you an understanding because the old soil science, forget it, it's history. The old soil science can't help you. You need some new understandings. And where it all starts is, um, first of all, how to create more like a pasture-type environment, you know, a grassland-type environment in your soil, over uh, an arable-type environment. What is the big difference? Well, the big difference is how, how long you get photosynthesis going and how deep you in, in, uh, uh, mix your soil around and, and, and always cut the, the rhizomes of the, of the fungus and whatsoever and then mix them up and mix them up and then the biological activity gets stirred up and it's not, it's not there anymore as it should be. Where else in a, in a, in a, in a, in a grassland, in a permanent grassland, you keep it intact, you know? That's probably one of the reasons, you know? but, but not only the only reason. What actually the new science is actually now talking about is there is a, uh, the, 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 there's a stable part of uh, carbon in the soil and there's an unstable part of carbon in the soil. To make it simple to understand, uh, 
the unstable <coughs> forms of carbon molecules in the soils, this is what we create, the way we till our soils, the way we incorporate so uh, residues, and the way we really decompose. Most of the, 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 the breakdowns of those, uh, of, those, uh, of those organic matter ends up in instable, uh, uh, in, in instable carbon uh, molecules, which eventually get mineralized. We know it. Huh? So they can stay there for a year or two, and eventually it gets all mineralized. Mineralized means the rest of the carbon that's there gets released to the atmosphere in terms of carbon dioxide, and that's, the, that's how we release all the nutrition from the previous crop to the next crop so they can take it up and, 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 and put it into our cells. So you need this cycle, you need this mineralization going on. But how to actually get always a little bit more of this instable carbon turned into stable carbon? And to understand this process, this is the mind-boggling thing right now. And for me personally, this is something that, that, that just gets, gets me hooked. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm realizing that we are just touching an edge of, of starting to understand something that could be very, very valuable for us to actually get into this current business. And at the end of the day, what I'm learning is it's the lignin part of our organic matter. Not the celluloses and not the other parts, or not the protein or whatever. It's the lignin part. That's what we have to concentrate on. And the lignin, where do we have most of our lignin? In wheat straw, in barley straw, in sugar beet uh, uh, leaves and whatever. There's not hardly anything in there, you know, uh, uh, in rape straw either. But it's the grains, the grains that, that produce the, the most amount of lignin. And if you have a decomposing process going on in the soil, which we normally introduce, which is oxygen-driven, mixing in oxygen, oxygen. Oxygen-driven means there's a lot of fungus and some bacteria is involved that always break down those, those carbon uh, molecules uh, into smaller carbon molecules by releasing some of the carbon in terms of carbon dioxide. But if you introduce a decomposing process that's bacteria, especially bacteria, phototrophic bacteria driven, uh, which is also a natural process, and create an environment for it, which is on the edge of aerobic and anaerobic. It's on the edge, huh? right there. It's not anaerobic, it's not aerobic. Uh, you have to create a certain environment in the so on the soil and surface, or actually you can do it also as a compost as well, similar to that. Um, then you can actually use certain bacteria to, with, uh, with a certain enzyme they produce to actually turn the lignin part into a stable carbon part. And that stable carbon part you can measure and it's like brown coal. You cannot lose it. It's there. You cannot burn it anymore. You know, it cannot be mineralized. Um, so that, it's, just, it's just one example of many other, there's many other ways of doing it. But anyway, this is what we have to start to understand. And, um, <clears throat> and, and on the other side, we also have to start to understand how we can create more a, a permanent grassland type environment as long as it po as is possible in the soil, than a, a bare soil, arable type uh, environment uh, in our soils. If you go back to our friends in Brazil, that's exactly what they're doing. Increasing their hunt from 100 days to 100, 200 days a year of pure diversity, of plant diversity, and an extreme photosynthesis uh, uh, um, uh, engine going, you know? Uh, and pumping carbon into soil like no tomorrow, which is all instable carbon, but they, they put so much into it that they, through no-till systems and whatsoever, they make, make sure that through decomposing, through mineralization, not all of it gets mineralized again. You know? And that's how they also increase their carbon. And some of it, by accident, also turns into, into stable carbon, which is very little, because nature has, has, a, has a system for it. But if they understand the way to do it now, possibly they can even increase this part of stable carbon uh, uh, increase in their soils. So anyway, I'm just giving you some of the, some of the thought rationales we're, we're on right now, where it's still in a very early stage. It's still not something where you can say, hey, here's the recipe, do it, and you will get that. No, we're, we're still a long, ways ago from, a, long, a long ways away from that, but it's going to be very, very exciting uh, the more we dig into this. And there's a lot of talk about it here, Michael, as well, but it's understanding it. It's understanding when you have a, a product which is made, so let's take mineral fertilizer as an example, who, that there's a lot of carbon CO2 involved in making Pro that. Who, whose carbon pro problem is that? Whose carbon is that? You know, I'm trying to make myself carbon neutral if I am trying to do, and I'm using some form of mineral fertilizer, which is a obviously a huge sort of no-no from a carbon point of view, but is that my problem? Is that the manufacturer's problem? 
You know, am I using that as part of my calculation or is it that is it his calculation because he's made it? But Tom, this is a this very, is a very easy, 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 simple thought rationale. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm also a manufacturer. I'm, I'm on the industrial side. So at the end of the day, what I'm looking for from, and that's what the Green Deal is also forcing me into, is every, every uh, raw material I buy, I have to make sure that it's carbon neutral. So I pay a price for this. What am I going to do? I make you pay it for, for I make I sell the product to you and I, I, I charge you for the same for the same price I paid to, to, to make it carbon neutral. So that means you're already buying stuff that's carbon neutral. So eventually your products, your your stuff, even maybe even maybe fuel huh, and everything will be at the time you paid for it carbon neutral. So then everything you do with it. That's where your carbon footprint starts. Okay. Yeah. So, otherwise, so otherwise it won't work. No, that's what I mean. It's a source. It always starts with the, in mining the coal, mining the crude oil, or uh, uh, putting up solar panels and, 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 and harvesting uh, electricity with sun and with wind and so on. That's where it starts. Yeah? That's, where it st that's, that's where it starts. And that's everywhere it starts, the one who, er the, who originates the, the raw material, he is the one responsible. So all you put as inputs in, first of all, they got to be neutral. They will be eventually neutral. That means they have a special price, the price attached to it. But then everything you add to it yourself, that's where your your, your business starts about becoming carbon neutral. And then on top of that, you don't want to be carbon neutral. You want to be carbon positive, and sell it, you know? separately. Separately. Yeah. But we have to, to do, do that. So, might so. Be better to do that, if you wanted to actually do that, you actually might be better not farming, one for a better word. You, you'd, be a, you'd, you'd have the land, but you'd be better not going through the motion and the seasonal, um, you know, growing crops. You mean putting all into grassland? grassland. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, you know, it, that, that's, that's going to be a challenge going forward. Yeah, but, but Jay, isn't, isn't, that, isn't that exciting? exciting? Isn't, that, isn't exciting that exciting that there that, will be a fight? Uh, from farm to farm, whether he should be putting it into continuous grassland. Now we're going to go down in our consumption of, uh, uh, of meat products and whatsoever. So do we need more grass for more animals? Or do we only grow grass for the sake of, 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 of sequestering carbon? And, uh, but, but I give you, I give you another thought, Reginald. James, and that's actually something we're on right now. And... Uh, if you understand this microbacterial carbonization, that's what, the, that's what this process is, you know, turning basically lignin into stable carbon. You know? What you could do is you could basically put, say, 10% of your arable land into continuous, uh, continuous cover crop that produces a maximum of organic matter. Uh, a lot of it has to be protein-based. Uh, and then you take... On the other 50% of your land, you grow your wheat, you take the wheat straw off and mix it with fresh grass, mixed grass uh, and legume silage in a, certain in a certain mix, because you need, for this microbacterial carbonization compost, you need a special mix. And then you put that together, and then you put it in a special uh, pile and you, 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 you lock the air off in terms of pushing it down with loading shovel and then let it expose it to the atmosphere and to rain and to the sunlight. And then you can turn it. I've seen it. Farmers, local farmers are doing it here. And then you can turn this in eight weeks into a marvelous compost like you wouldn't believe when you send it in for, soil, for, soil, for, for testing. In terms of nutrition values, it doesn't smell. Whatever, everything that doesn't smell, what does it mean? It's good. It's good. It's good. It's like, it's like, it, tastes, it, tastes, it smells like soil. It's all the nutritions are locked up in a way where they cannot be leached out or, or denaturated. And, and all the lignin part is turned into very stable carbon, which ends up in brown coal. And so you could actually use 10% of your land not only to, to push in a lot of uh, instable carbon and leave it in there because you don't till it. Also, you take off a certain amount of uh, organic matter in terms of uh, fresh grass silage, 
to be able to feed this lignin-based uh, straw to get this right mix, to get this decomposing going, and then have a perfect fertilizer. And on top of the fertilizer, you can measure the amount of, 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 uh, of stable carbon. You actually can physically measure it you know, before you spray it on your field again, and you have a perfect fertilizer as well, Increase, and increasing your carbon content. Isn't that exciting? At the same time, you're decreasing the amount of grain being produced. What does that do? The grain price goes down. Well, I don't know about that, chap, because then what happens is somebody goes and plows up more grassland or pulls some forest down and creates a bit more cropping somewhere else in the world. We end up exporting our environmental behavior somewhere else. So that's, that's not quite uh, as important. Be very, very careful, James, about that, because what we're just talking, the same talk I had six weeks ago in Brazil with large Brazilian farmers, exactly the same pattern, exactly the same thing about climate change, about what can we do for the climate, what can we do to, to make our crops less chemical residuals in there and blah, 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 blah. You can have the same talk in, in, uh, in Australia. I had the same talk uh, uh, in March this last year in Australia, all over where I was. Ex everywhere the same. There's not in the in, in there's not a single area in this world except the Eastern European part, Russia and Ukraine, which are still they're still they're still growing up. You know those farmers. They're still they're still in, in a cocky farmers, and ah, we you know we got all this uh, health, we got all this black soil, and we just till it deeper and deeper and mine the carbon. They're still mining carbon. You know. Uh, actually reducing the soil quality, but some of them are also learning that they have to stop this. But the rest of the world, no, it's going the other way. And if this carbon sequestering is a worldwide business, it's not a business locally to England and locally to Europe, it's a worldwide business. And I, get, and I bet you Kamala Harris is not only driving a diet change, she's mainly driving a climate change, and she will drive a much stronger uh, political project uh, than we drive in, in Europe with our Green Deal. And so, so those farmers in the US, they've been talking about carbon sequestering, about uh, uh, looking for other crops than soybeans and corn, uh, uh, like you wouldn't believe pretty soon. And they will be very innovative, I, get, I bet you. They only need the, the, the right direction, the right pressure. And the guy before gave him only one direction, go backwards. Yeah. Effectively, Michael, you're, you're almost sort of designing a brand new subsidy system which won't be based on what we're used to, the BPS, but is going to be based on a new subsidy coming in. And it could be, again, what perhaps a lot of us have dreamed wouldn't happen, is you're effectively going to pay people to do nothing, which, um, you know, is, is going to resist the, the urge to release land. You know, we've all been on this, uh, well, Tom and I especially, have been on this sort of scale drive for the last, uh, since we left school. And it may be that, you know, th this bringing new schemes, replacing the, the, the BPS with these type of schemes is going to halt, you know, you know that opportunity. See, I'm not, not sure, sure that, that you that... should call this a new subsidy. Uh, in real terms, subsidy should be only there to support an industry that has that has gone south, as the Americans say, to bring them back north, you know? And it should not be there permanently. That's actually the real, the real understanding of subsidy. Here, we have a concern about society, of the majority of the society in this world, especially about the younger society, that we should save natural resources. And we should that way hopefully have an influence on climate change. And there's a demand. This is a real demand. And there's a free market for this demand at the end. It's politically guided, but at the end, it's a free market. Give you an idea, another idea, to understand where, where I'm coming from. I'm, 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 it's still very early, and it's still not all thought through. Um, like I told you this already before, we have a project going on in Czech Republic with Skoda. Uh, because we happen to have one of our farms right around this main factory in Madla Bolislav in, uh, uh, in, in, in Czech Republic. And uh, about a year and a half ago, we started talking to them, what are you doing for, carbon, for, for your carbon footprint? And then they said, oh, we're big into this, and we have lots of problems with our combustion engines, but long term, we're going to go for batteries anyway, because that way we get around this, uh, this, this footprint, this carbon footprint with, uh, with burning fuel, uh, fuel, fuel in whatsoever. But we still have an issue. And then they said, 
We calculate today, in five years from now, we will be very effectively producing battery cars, which still, through the manufacturing process, will have a footprint per car of 16 metric tons. Today, it's more like 50. But this 16 metric tons is inevitable. Everything we've done before is already, we got rid of it, but this 16 tons. Now this 16 tons, we calculate 100 euros per ton. This is what our boss said we have to calculate, put in the, put in the, put in the calculation today. Can you help us on that? The only way is to sequester it. Either we pump carbon dioxide in old uh, boreholes from, from crude oil, you know, this is one way of doing it, or we plant forests in Saudi Arabia or uh, in uh, Peru, whatsoever, where nobody ever knows where the trees are standing and where they will ever grow. You know? Or you farmers in front of my door, in front of my factory, have a solution actually to do it on your fields. And this is why we come with this uh, uh, microbiology carbonization, you know, with 5% to 10% of growing a, a grassland mix, you know, and then making a compost and spraying the compost on the wheatland and using wheat, st wheat straw for making this compost. It's very, 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 valuable, a very valuable fertilizer and on top a very valuable carbon source which can be measured. They will not pay us 100 euros a ton to start with, but they're calculating it in. So there's a business there. It's not driven by government. It's not driven by laws yet. It's them doing it themselves, because they see it coming. And so it's not only Skoda, it's everyone. It's everywhere happening, everywhere happening in this world. Steel mills, they are, they are uh, cement factories are big into this. You know? they're, all into, they're all searching, they're all getting ready for it. They're not saying that they pay for it yet, they want to, uh, they want to have a solution. So it's an exciting free market principle, uh, and it's not a new, subs new way of subsidy. It is a new way of real income, additional income, on top of growing wheat and whatsoever. That's what I see coming. I may be wrong. So we've talked about carbon now for years, haven't we? You know, probably 12 years we've talked about this opportunity. You know, effectively, you, you could argue sort of, it's, it's almost like a guilt tax, isn't it? Is, is, is that the, the, the more we spend on, on electricity and things, the more we need to offset elsewhere. It would be nice if agriculture can become the solution. Uh, exactly. It would be good to be part exactly. of an industry exactly. which is a solution provider for, the, for, for everybody. And that would be a good win story for the industry. Exactly, exactly. exactly. That's where we're, we're actually, with Brexit or without Brexit, that's actually where we're going. We are going for a way that we become the solution for health issues and for climate issues. And I think that's the new role of farmers in the future. You said it. Question, Michael. Um, if, if with Brexit and everything, how do you see supporting the UK going forward as a European manufacturer? What what challenges do you think you're going to have? Me is me is my, my, my business. Yeah, well, my is mostly full of red machinery. So of course you being able to provide me machinery is quite important. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting question. Which um, um, uh, there's the, 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 how do I, 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 I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled how to answer it. Uh, why am I doing this with you and with the public? Why why am I why we are we trying to raising those issues? Why we're going on those topics? Why we're discussing those topics? Well, I want to make sure myself also. I'm selfish. Uh, that where are, where are we going to take our business? Well, we, this, especially in my family, where we, have a, where we had a very strong discussion in our families, also with our next generation. We're very clear what we want to be with, where we want to be with our business in the future. We don't know where we are, but where we want to be. We want to be a solution for making people healthier to, by what they eat and also helping to save the climate. That's where we want to be. And so as long as we have this direction, we, we're not afraid of not finding the solutions at the soon enough to be, to, to be able to adapt our business, which we are actually doing in a way already, to make sure that we're going along with you guys. Um, at the end of the day, you're our customers. So and, and in a way, as I'm saying, selfish means I'm, I'm trying to help you to find solutions for the future, which at the end of the day will be, will be my solution to stay alive. 
And the worst thing would be to start building plows and try, trying to help you to, to use plows and how to go back in old, old ways of farming, you become more intensive and try to, to, to make you believe instead of growing 10 ton average wheat crop, I, I help you to produce 20 tons per hectare wheat crops. Who is interested in that, by the way? It's interesting, nobody anymore. It's interesting. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it would be different. The only talk was about how can we increase yield? How can we increase yield? The theoretic yield of wheat in test plots is 20 tons. If you go for this and this variety, blah, 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 and if you go for this and this process. Who is interested in that? Nobody. We stopped talking about this already years ago because we realized there's a change going on. There's another opportunity for farming. Much, much bigger opportunity for farming than growing bigger yields, which at the end of the day will kill us. Look at a BPS reduction, Michael, of 60% in the next three years. Chasing yield is not necessarily the wrong thing to do. Wait a minute. I'm not, I didn't tell, tell you, you to, to, to stop to... chasing yield. I didn't tell you that. You still will chase yield while you're looking for other opportunities and learn from it and see whether there's another business potential. And knowing you, you are the quickest one to change once you find out where there's more money. I mean, t t 20 years now has been spent on reducing I input costs, whether it's um, agronomically or whether it's machinery based. That's true, yeah. And, and we, we try to drive it, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's probably a shame that actually 20 years later we're still thinking now with Brexit and BPS going, but we still need to cut costs and whatever. It seems to be the common, common theme in this industry, as opposed to focusing on how we're actually going to create new markets or create a premium on, on, on what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. But actually, here, it's interesting. I got just some questions from the audience here, which basically fits with almost what you, what, what, what you just were commenting. There's one, guy, one person uh, uh, sending send in, send in a question to me um, uh, asking, asking us, um, how do you think we can market our produce better to general public? These, there seems to be more support behind them in the media. Uh, I hope I understand this question right. Did you understand this question right? Effectively, it's, it's effectively creating a marketplace which is closer to the consumer than what we are at the moment. I mean, as combinable crop farmers, we generally pick up the phone, sell to a merchant, the merchant um, organizes it to be taken away and that's the last we see of it. And, and effectively, there's a, there's a sort of a school of thought that there's a lot of premium lost back to the farm because we export all the premium to other people in the chain. I mean, only, only a, a, this morning, there's a chap in the office and he has eggs delivered, a great big box of eggs, and he, he sells them to him for half what um, you can buy them for in the, um, in the supermarket. So that means that he's already getting a greater premium from doing that for sending little lorries around. But there's 50% disappeared between that farmer's gate and, and that supermarket shelf. And, and think of an egg, he's already put it in the box and, and, and there's no other further process that's happened, but 50% of that has disappeared. So we, we want to try and create more premium, and it's something we've been working on, is, is cleaning crops and things and trying to, 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 to get to a different stage. So, example, we're cleaning beans, and then we're putting those in containers, and then they're going off, but they're already cleaned. Well, that can create a premium, but, you know, might make 30% difference to the, to the farming budget, which, you know, is quite a lot on beans. If, you, if you've got if you're growing beans, they very quickly can lose your money. And as we yeah. talked about earlier of rotation, we've got to try and grow different crops, but be able to increase the value of those. Yeah, but increasing, increasing the value of those means that either you look for the niche, and, uh, and, 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 and make sure you're in this niche, and or you also make sure that you are in, uh, uh, that, that the consumer is aware of you personally. Because yeah. that, that difficult is a difficult business. And, and they, actually, what, what, what are we doing, doing right now with our discussion here? Um, was there anything we talked about we would not want the public our consumer at the end of the day to listen? 
I mean, you, you, you Michael, there's two it's things in agriculture. And I think you've got scale, that's exactly especially. where it is. I think this is what it is. I think, I think we, we need, need this type, type of discussions we're having right now to make sure that they're being spread out in the public. Because what are we lacking? You just said it, James. We are lacking that we're just actually on one side, we're the primary producer. At the end of the day, nobody realized what we're doing. At the end of the day, they're pitching us down. And, um, and, uh, and uh, there's so much we have to say. And as, uh, especially right now, we still think, we still think about it, then we'll more do it. You do it more, a little bit more than some of the neighbors do it already, you know. But there's so much, much more what they want to listen about. How we save the climate, how we save soil, how we look at microbiological activity in the soil, and blah, blah, blah. How we possibly think about replacing some of our chemicals with biologicals, and so on and so on. How we also help you to change your diets to become healthier eating and blah, 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 blah. We're concerned about this. And if, they, if the public doesn't understand that we're concerned about this because we're not, we have no, no channel to talk to them, no t channel to express our, our ways of how we discuss things, how we think things through, uh, they will always think about us, oh, those farmers, they don't care about anything. All they want to do is they want to rip us off and produce the worst, uh, the worst food uh, that's out there. You know? Because we do actually have quite a bad PR when it comes to the, the consumer being the general public. We have got quite a, exactly. a poor presence sadly but actually I'm, I'm quite proud of a lot of things we we do in in farming it's just trying to get that message out to to, to the wider product i mean regarding the the premium michael is that you, you 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 there aren't you can't all do niche markets you either specialism or scale i've always worked on the scale um uh, side and it's worth trying to find additional premiums on the scale market is really where i i'm putting my energy because, you know, you either create a niche market, as we have done with cleaning oats and things like that, or organic goods, but that only represents 3%, you know, of the business. And so the, you can't suddenly grow that uh, overnight dramatically, you know, to produce cash. And it's cash what you need is profits. If you want carbon or you want environmental or you want biological or you want cover crop, fine. But the one fundamental thing you need is cash. And it's generating cash, and that that is that with the, with the change we're going to have with this 60% um, reduction, we've got to um, adapt. Which I know the industry will um, in, in creating more cash. And I think where that that question was led to is how we're going to create that premium to get rid of the BPS. And I think that all real farmers would agree that nobody wants BPS. Nobody wants to be in a subsidised industry. Nobody wants to be filling in the forms and receiving money. And we've sort of fallen into this trap. £200 a tonne is very helpful at the moment if we're going to lose BPS. Because if you break it down, if you're going to get £80 an acre um, in, um, you know, from BPS payment and you're going to grow wheat at four tonne, you know, that's £20. Yes. But but James, James, I want to give you... A, uh, actually, it's interesting to listen to what you just said. Knowing who you are, knowing what you do, um, at the end of the day, you're not only an entrepreneur, you're not only a one who likes to scale things, you also are concerned about the consumer. So don't put yourself into a, into a, into a, into a position where maybe most of, of the public uh, people around you would put, want to put you, you know. You're one who wants to only scale, farm a lot of acres and don't care. Don't care about environment, don't care about the product you produce and whatsoever. I think that's not you. You do. Yeah. And, um, and uh, my, my business uh, well, is environmental. I want to give, give you just, a, just, just, just take a take note, a note here. here. Once we once we close this deal here, look at this video clip. Uh, Simon Sinek, write down. Simon Sinek. Um, and um, and here here what is this? Ah, come on, I have it here. And watch this video clip. Um, how can we make it aware to everybody out there? Simon Sinek. Uh, it is, I only have the German version for it. It's called, actually, you, if, you open the, if you open YouTube on Simon Sinek, it shows, um, it shows him, you see this? No. He has a flip chart. You see that? That video clip. Mm -hmm. Open it and listen to it. And then, then you will understand 
where we have to go. You, everybody of you out there in the public right now listening to us, uh, open this and look at this video clip from Simon Sinek. I don't know what the name of this stupid thing is because it's only, it says Führungspersönlichkeit in German. It doesn't mean anything to you guys. Um, but you will see it. It's a flip chart. He talks about the why, what, and how. The why, what, and how, and listen to it. And then you understand what our job of farmers is. He is just speaking for us like you wouldn't believe. Now, here's another question uh, from the audience. Um, what will be the future skills of farmers? Farming the system? Stock market broker skills? What are the future skills? The above. Everything, as it always has been. No, I, Tom, I, I think it's going to be a lot deeper from, than what, what we've sort of grown up doing. And because the, the world is changing quite quickly, and you look at the, our sort of model, we, we cultivate the land, don't we, and we get a, an agronomist who walks on and he tells us what chemical to spray, and then we, we, we spray it, you know, on a, on a very brief view. Whereas going forward in things that Michael's been talking about with the biological and things like that, I think actually the education of who's going to be farming and how they're farming and what they're thinking and what they're doing is going to be a lot deeper than it is, it, it is in the current model. It is. It's, it's a mindset change, though. So where you've been brought up as your uh, chemical generation, if you want to call that, that's going to change. The chemical generation will go and it'll be more about carbon, more about um, biologicals, more about that side. So that's, it'll, that'll just change. It'll surpass. The chemical part will be there, your useful part of what you do, but you'll still have everything else that you'll do. A farm is a, is a very sort of mixed skill because you do do absolutely everything. It might come that if you go to so much scale that you have people who come into your business to do certain jobs, but as a general whole, you at the top of the tree have to understand, at least a brief understanding of everything and a believer in why you're steering the ship the way you're steering it. Oh, and you could argue. I would want to add one more specific skill, which we already talked about today, which I think is most necessary for, for today and for the future farming, is microbiology. If I, I, if I would, I never went to university, by the way, but if I would go back to a university I never went to, um, I would probably choose microbiology first before, before, before agricultural engineering. Because I understand, the more I dig into all these questions we were raising today, you know, and so on and so on, carbon sequestering and, 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 uh, and uh, chemicals over biologicals and blah, blah, blah. I think we have, a, this is why our uh, agricultural science is lacking so much. The microbiology had never much of a space uh, in the agricultural science. And it's just the opposite today. We have to go deep into microbiology to understand what we're doing and what's happening out there. Actually, we are hiring a microbiologist right now because we want to have uh, uh, expertise in-house now and not only rely on people telling us what's going on. Uh, the question is to find the right person that is deep into this. And that's what, the big, that's what the big operators in Brazil are doing. The first thing they're doing is they're hiring their own microbiologists and, 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 and building a lab on, on site. I think there's a basic thing beyond that as well, is that actually there's an understanding of soil in general is so old. So all the main soil scientists in the UK now will be retirement age, if not older, because back, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, when it was pushed hard initially, that's when they did all their sort of education. Since there and now, there's been a huge sort of education gap which is why um, I think, yeah, microbiology is important, Michael. Absolutely it is, and I can see it being the big point, but there's a lot more basics. So on a up and sort of a, a farming business, which is already doing a lot of that, that's all right. But there's a lot of arable land out there which hasn't even got its basics right yet. And mm -hmm. understanding that basics first, you know, is the most important part. Understanding that then you can go into the microbiology to then pull out the bits you want to do to improve it. But it's improving and stopping depleting of soil, which is the most important part to start off with. And that's where probably the agronomist's role will change because right, exactly. 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 and this is this is why this is why, this is why either the agronomists change their role or you have to change the agronomist. Yeah? 
this is what's hap what we see happening here in Germany, for instance. We have a new type of agronomists coming from a microbiological side, or they actually re-educate them or add education on a microbiological side and bring that into the equation. And some of them become very successful. Yeah? They are still in a very, it's a very early stage and they still don't know everything, but it's very interesting what's happening there. But give you another thought rationale, why we are there where we are today. I mean, you all went to agricultural university or agricultural school, um, and you probably heard about this uh, uh, old scientist called Justus Liebig, who invented fertilizer. He's a German. 150 years ago, Justus Liebig invented the fertilizer, chemical fertilizer. He was a chemist. He, was, he didn't care about biology at all. He said, forget about biology. It's the chemistry. We know what the plant consists out of. We know what the plant needs. And if she can't get it from the soil, we make it, we make it artificially in a, chemical, in a chemical form, which is water dilutable, and we, call it, we, we, we put the soil into a salty solution. Period. And this is what our whole science in arable farming is based on for the last 150 years. And the success is big yields. Resistances and all the other things that come with it, and a very low level of, nut uh, of nutrition values of our, of our main crops we produce. Because we only uh, count yield in protein and starch and whatsoever, but not in manganese content, boron content, and whatsoever. That's the outcome of Justus Liebig. It's so interesting, you watch this whole history. And by the way, Justus Liebig, uh, when he died on his bed, he had his students around him, and he, had, and he said to his students, nobody talks about this, but uh, some historians know about this, he said, I'm questioning whether I'm right. Whether the biological part still plays a more important role than I thought. But I'm a chemist, so I didn't care about biology. So that's why all, sorry, make it maybe too simple, but that's why maybe all our education system all over the world is basically based around this. And that's why the microbiological part has played a very little role in this, which is sad. Not saying that there's some guys out there, some professors out there that are really good into this, but we don't listen to them. But it's something like to be proud of. You know, I, I know you, you might think, oh, something produced, you know, in a chemical aspect is something you know, to be shy away from now. But actually, our role as a farmer has been to be producing food and, you know, to, to, to prevent starvation. And running that path with the chemicals and the nitrogen has been a tremendous success for humanity. Yes, that's, that was the job in the 50s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Yeah. But starvation today is only a question of spreading food to the people who can't afford it. It's not producing it, producing enough. So that has that's fundamentally changed, changed the last 20 years. So we still base, we excuse our doings still based on things from the 50s and 60s and 70s. But this doesn't fit today anymore. This promise of the world population growing by a certain amount of percent every so many years. <laughs> and ever since I first started, it was this is going to be the cure for you. You're going to be so busy because you've got to grow so much food for everyone else. And it's just a facade. It's not true. It really isn't true. It's, 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 it's not true not in true different in ways. ways. Not only that, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's more or less a fairy tale. I mean, even if we have by 2050 10 billion people, if there's a small diet change, only a small diet change, a little bit less animal-based foods, a little bit more uh, uh, plant-based foods, we can produce enough food already today for 10 billion people. It's so simple. With less focus on yield and more focus on quality, or soil quality, uh, nutrition values on, 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 in the crops and whatsoever and whatsoever. I mean, we know it. This is not saying that it's going to be all organic. If we go 100% organic, uh, it'll be tough. Huh? But, I mean, Taking away chemicals as, as what we've seen in, in, in the sort of last five years especially, you know, has seen a massive shift in change in people's cropping and ability to farm in, in different ways. You know, take the horses rape market. I mean, it, at one time we were 50 percent horses rape. And um, actually this year we did put some in the in the rotation for the first time since 2012. But, you know, I can see as the chemicals get re reduced, but the biological of what you're referring to will change just purely because we won't have an alternative. In, and that's what, what's happening now, is the alternative that came in a can or, 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 or could be bought, it's been taken away. 
and that's been that's been changed not by us as an industry that's been changed by by a government level yes yes i yes, agree with you here here's another another, another super yeah, here's another simple question. I just want to make sure that uh, some of the questions are, uh, are brought forward, uh, which uh, our audience is placing. Um, again, a very simple one. What crops will farmers grow in the future if we are uh, changing our way of eating culture? What is it? More soybeans, more corn, more feed wheat? Probably not. It's going to, if you're reducing your livestock sort of consumption as a whole, therefore you're reducing your feeds to your livestock, aren't you? So a change from, I think you're always going to grow, you're going to grow some sort of protein, but that protein is going to be human-based protein rather than, you know, rather than the livestock protein. So there'll be a change there, maybe. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. Feed grains, that will, that will be changed dramatically to more human consumption grains or a different type of grain. Um, yeah, you know, something specialist maybe for used, I don't, yeah, I don't think we know, to be honest, but my gut feeling is, is there a reduction in feeds, anything which is used in the livestock industry. And probably still more, I still think we'll grow crops for energy. I still think we'll but grow crops. Take this thought a little bit further. If we feel that we have to reduce in our rotations the amount of crops for feed. And we replace it by crops we feed di directly into the human uh, uh, f food system. And there's a factor of one to three, about. You know, beef is one to seven, uh, uh, chicken is one to two, and pork is one to three. It's about roughly one to three. So instead of three, cal three calories we need to produce one calorie of, uh, of uh, animal-based food, uh, plant-based food, we go one to one, okay? So there's two parts too much. So we would end up in theory with too much acres of crops where we normally produce corn and soybeans on, for instance, sitting idle there, because if they would produce uh, chickpeas or beans or f uh, bread, wheat or whatsoever, uh, uh, we have enough of this already. So I'm, I'm making this up a little bit. Um, probably it's, it's not as, as, it will not be as near as serious than I'm making this up. I'm just making it up to, 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 to kind of get to a point. Um, the point would be, maybe we should be interested in not increasing our yields, we should be interested in actually decreasing our yields by increasing some other values where the income could be at the end of the day maybe even more than only producing yield. That's maybe at the end of the day, especially for us arable farmers, the, 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 the long-term view, we should be start uh, 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 opening our eyes and ears and, 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 and trying to find solutions. Is that the right rationale? I think so. Yeah, I mean, people get very excited about using that land for growing a, a, an energy crop or for energy of some description, however, however that works. Like energy crops or, uh, no? Yeah, and of course, there's anything, there's always bad, there's always the bad version of that as well, but equally, there's some pretty good ones out there. So I just think a mix is like we've always been, there's always been a chunk use for energy, there's always been a chunk grown um, for, for, for food. So I just think, yeah, it'll just bring, it'll allow you to perhaps do a bit of everything. Give you another thing. It might be timing that's the issue, Tom, going forward or something. Do we take the energy market and you're trying to lift maize off in October, November, December, and you're putting mud on the roads and various other things? That isn't a great advert for our, um, you know, for our consumer. You know, it's 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 trying to balance the timing of looking after the land as well, uh, and timing of when you do that. Uh, you know, is if the good thing about wheat as a general rule is you don't create a lot of damage to the land in in harvesting wheat in good conditions but if you try to lift sugar beet in january for example in in poor winter conditions you can you can cause a lot of destruction yeah. and I, and I, and i can see that the development of our rotation will come about on how we're treating you know the, the land and how we're affecting the communities that we're, we're living in and but that's short term as well. So when hopefully technology improves and we get more automation, more autonomous stuff, that will all get better. And it's just selecting the appropriate crop and the appropriate 
sort of rotation to grow on your land type. I just think it's you know it's sensible to probably do a little bit of everything. I would have thought from a from a whatever your soil's able to produce. Well, I think the robotic side going forward, you know, is something I'm personally quite excited about when that starts to to take off. I mean, you know, that that wouldn't necessarily be you know due due to a staff decision, but but more to do with the efficiency. Uh, and the timeliness and it's, you know, perhaps running at night when you're asleep and that type of thing and, and, and the windows of opportunities it can open up. Uh, that, I think, is going to be exciting going forward. And, and that may be where we can produce more on, on, on less, which has, of course, been the last 20 years of what we try to do, which sort of falls into what Michael wants to do is, you know, maybe using less land, but we're being more efficient. Where robotics might be the start of that revolution. It is, but I think it'll take longer to happen than we all think it will. It well, uh, well, you I, I, say I will, I will, I will add a little bias on that, on that because robotics, uh, uh, I can tell you, that we're moving a lot faster than everybody can think. Yeah. But not saying that robotics at the end of the day will be, will be the solution again. It's only one part of another solution, of a solution to, to actually build another new, new big picture. Yeah. But at the end of the day, what is robotics for if we don't have a big picture about where the diet is going to go in the future, where the climate is going to go in the future, and whatsoever? So that's why I say, at the end of the day, our discussion is very important in terms of uh, where we put our priorities. The priorities is where we're going to go, and then how do we go with it? How do we get there? And then robotics is just one piece to, to get there. You know? I agree. Just, Michael, just between Tom and I and you, what, what robotics are you working on at the moment? Oh, can we switch off the camera? Can I? Can <laughs> this is what I've done for the last two weeks. Corona is. <laughs> I think we technically we'll see see a little bit of it. <laughs> we we're we're actually in a, in a couple different ways we're going right now, but it's already for years we've been doing this. Um, but uh, we're putting stuff in the field right now, um, so it's quite interesting, quite exciting, quite exciting. Um, so anyway. Um, I had one thought, and I've forgotten about it. Well, let me let me go for another another question here. Um, well, um, this is this is again a simple one. Uh, uh, a person is asking, uh, how do you measure carbon? What can be what can be the business case? Um, <clears throat> well, maybe I can answer this a little bit from my side uh, before I ask you. Um, first of all, measuring carbon is very hard if you want to do it on an initial basis. If you do it over a period of five, six, seven years, then you can, as a tendency, measure the, the sea orc, you know, uh, uh, in your soil. Like you probably also do soil tests and always look at the carbons, and sometimes the carbons change uh, from one sample to another sample and from one crop to another crop. So it's, it's quite tricky because it's, some of it gets mineralized, and so, you know, one year more, one year less, you have a wet year, then there's more, less decomposing, more mineralization, you know, dry years the other way around, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so this is, and there's, there's quite, we, have, we are in two organizations involved that are working on a, on a, on a certification system to measure actually and to, 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 to prove the increase of carbon. And it's very, very tricky. That's why I say, that's why, I come, uh, that's why we come from this compost, this, this microbacterial uh, compost, because I can measure it before I put it on, you know. I can measure the amount uh, and uh, test uh, the, the, the amount, uh, test the, the percentage of, of, of stable carbon, and that way I can prove it, you know. Um, and, um, and what is the business case? I mean, I gave you the business case already, and uh, with one with the Skoda example, you know, they are waiting for it. Uh, right now, we are in, in our green deal, 25 euros is period. So we, we get, in any case, 25 euros per ton if we can prove it, when we sequester it, which will go up to 35 next year and to 50 the year after. And probably the 100, the 100 euros per ton are not very far away. You know? And so it's only about us to figure out a way to do it and how to prove it. Again, this is what the discussion we had already before. So, well, I guess I had my question. We answered all the questions. What else is on there? 
Well, there's one more question, which in one way we have already answered, but maybe, maybe we can do it again. How are the moves to more biologicals? Use of cover crops, focus on soil health, etc., going to going to impact uh, uh, how is it going to impact the machinery industry is also a question to me and to you. Well, uh, <clears throat> more biologicals, first, is, first of all, is well, we have to understand micro, the microbiological uh, science. Yeah? And, and, what, uh, and it, it's so interesting uh, uh, when you, like, for instance, um, um, I maybe have these funny names, trichoderma, and all these funny names of these different bacteria and fungus. And like, for instance, a, 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 a fungicide effect of biological fungicide is that you use a special fungus against, say, uh, uh, um, foma or uh, uh, helminthosporium or, or, or uh, uh, mildew or whatever, and it's not that that fungus you spray is killing the mildew fungus. No, what it does, instead of letting the mildew fungus cover the plant surface, it covers the plant surface faster than the mildew does. So there is no area for the mildew fungus actually to, to live anymore. So it, instead of killing it, it takes its habitat away. By, doing it, by, by covering the plant in a different way, it's not doing harm to the plant like the mildew does. You know? So this is a fungicidal effect of biologicals uh, uh, um, they use. Like, in the, 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 like, uh, like this one guy in Brazil I showed you the, the video clip from, uh, he's also, uh, I think, five or 6,000 hectares of, uh, of uh, cotton. Cotton is a very intensive crop. You, you fly through 20, 30 times and spray for insecticides and so on and fungicides. And um, he said he has a caterpillar there that is very, very, very bad, does very bad damage to it. And he has a special uh, bacteria that all it does, it actually gets into the, uh, into, the, into the lungs of the caterpillar. And what it does there, it produces a slime, you know, a, a, a kind of a sticky, uh, it makes actually the, 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 the slime sticky, and that way it basically drowns itself. Uh, and so this is the, those, are, and those are known effects in microbiology for years and years and years and years. This is nothing, this is nothing new. It's known for hundreds of years. It's just not being used because it was too complicated. So, at the end of the day, well, let's get more interested in microbiology. This is probably the best answer to this question. Was haben wir noch alles? Sind wir fertig dann, oder? So anyway, um, I think we're coming to the end of our of our session. So, what have you guys to say? <laughs> oh, first time, Tom, you've let me go first. <laughs> Obviously, was a question you couldn't answer. <laughs> uh, but it, I mean, I, I always think, Michael, having, having talks in January at the beginning, after you've had a period um, over that Christmas to, to, to have a bit of a reset in your mind, like, the, you know, in the UK, they have an Oxford farming conference. Uh, which I, you know, used to go to, is really stimulating because it starts to get you thinking differently. We've got quite a big season coming up with with the spring. We're on the back of a poor weather, thinking about where the future of farming is going and and, and what routes to take. We've got major changes coming forward as as, as we talked about, you know. And we've got all great hopes on it. Where Elms is going to going to going to be amazing and make all the difference. Actually, where do we see ourselves in 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 twenty years? you know, at the, the end of my, my career is it will not be the same as what we are today. And I'm, 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 I'm rather hoping that carbon has come in and there is a trading platform there which brings a level of maturity to agriculture and, and a new framework and, and creates an excitement out there with consumers and the general public, which then actually in turn creates people wanting to come into the industry. That's always my biggest fear is actually we're not sexy enough and we, we need to attract new young people. And if we start going down the, the roads, what we're, we're talking about with biological and carbon and things, I can see that our industry and robotics is going to open up and that's going to bring some new thinkers in who have got nothing to do with agriculture in the past, haven't grown up in it, but are excited and want to be in it. Now, as soon as you start to get those people in with different ideas and views, agriculture is going to really take off again and be exciting, because I could almost suggest that it's stalled at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, and I'm the same as James, Michael. I mean, I'm apprehensive, but at the same time, sort of excited about what's going to happen in the next few years. It'll be an opportunity, as, as James already said. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to having my vaccine so I can go and <laughs> talk to the person rather than sat in my office in a miserable January day. Um, but no, yeah, it's it's yeah, but it's there's there's big changes coming. Quite what they're going to be, I'm not sure. I hope they don't get sort of smothered by mm. by politics and um, and sort of basically take the shine off it. But there, yeah. there looks to be for the right people doing the right job. There looks to be a an exciting opportunity for 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 ag going forward. But time will tell. Very interesting. Well, <clears throat> um, from my point of view, um, my final comment is that um, I'm now more or less 40 years, both as a farmer and a farm manufacturer in, in my industry. And it was a very exciting 40 years and I've seen a lot of changes. And a lot of, and, I, I, and with our business, our family could be also be part of those changes, especially in arable farming. And we're very proud about this. But the, 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 the opportunities, the changes I see coming today in farming that are there already today are far more than what I've ever seen in 40 years. And that makes me so excited. I, want, I wished I would be 40 years younger because the times are even more interesting than what I've seen the last 40 years. That's what I want to say. And um, I think we all agree there's more opportunities out there with or without Brexit, with or without Green Deal than there ever was. Thank you very much. <laughs>